tonight we're here together to practice and really reflect on some beautiful teachings. There's a number of folks here who are part of the regular Well of Being Dharma Collective. Can we see you raise your hands? Yay, welcome everyone. And we have had just the great fortune of making our way through this book. I will say looks can be deceiving. This book is small, but it is so powerful, right? There are so many ways. And I found, um, as have many of the students here, that you can revisit the teachings many, many, many times. I think one of the reasons these teachings are so powerful right now, especially, is it gives us an opportunity to reconnect with these three precious pills I know Rinpoche will talk about and to really feel a sense of being able to find that, that stillness, silence, that warmth and openness that allows us to be in connection with the natural world. So many of us, when we think about the natural world, it might be a little bit of a transactional relationship. Oh, that tree looks nice. I like being out in the ocean. But what Rinpoche is offering and will share with us tonight is creating a deeper relationality one in which you can invite the wisdom qualities of the natural world. Just really, I have to say, so inspiring for me to discover these teachings. So for those of us who've already been reading, you have a little background, but for those who haven't, no problem. And I'm sure many of you already know about Rinpoche, but I wanted to share a bit more for those of you who might not know. He's coming to us from the Ban tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, which is, many of you might be familiar with Vajrayana or Tibetan Buddhism, but this is a tradition that really calls from the natural and indigenous wisdom before Buddhism arrived in Tibet. And what I've noticed about that tradition, there's a lot more interbeing with the natural world, like we'll be seeing tonight. Rinpoche has uh, students in 25 countries. He has at least seven books. This one is only one of them. He speaks all over the world, is a respected teacher, also a Geshe. So his dedication and commitment to the path and to teaching us is really precious and wonderful. So you'll hear that here. I want to share that Rinpoche has a lot of online programs so you can deepen your knowledge in things like um, dream yoga, these three precious pills. He offers an online cyber sangha in conversation with wonderful humans, scientists, philosophers, other practitioners. Next Friday, I am having the good fortune to join Rinpoche. So it's always online. It's streamed through Facebook. And that's a really great way to stay in touch, as well as looking up about his centers, Lingmingcha centers that you can find online. And before I hand it over to Rinpoche, I just really want to have a deep bow to all the volunteers of the San Francisco Dharma Collective who made this possible. So many of you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And just being able to be in this space with you all is such a treat. So thank you, Rinpoche. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so since we have not so much time, I wanted to dive into it right away. So I'll try to stay close to the title of the uh, talk tonight. It's a uh, soul retrieval and pain body. I just I wanted to describe a little bit what these concepts are. So, so first of all, soul retrieval, the idea of soul retrieval uh, in Bern tradition, uh, we have this concept of losing soul, damaging soul, um, and recovering, restoring, retrieving, bringing back soul through through different means, through means, rituals, through communicating with the spirits, uh, movement, breath, uh, activating these energies in our body, uh, awakening the consciousness, different type of awarenesses in our mind, to reconnect back to the source and retrieving our quality. So this is a, in some sense of concept is kind of somewhere between very shamanic, very, very uh, shamanic way to approach one, and then also very um, Dzogchen way to approach, Dzogchen way to more energetic and awareness way to approaching 
retrieving the soul. So that, that so that's the concept, original concept. That I wrote a book called uh, "Healing with the Form, Energy, and Light." So healing with the form related with the rituals and forms, and relating energies is the movement, breath, and the related in the body, and the light referring to different form of awareness. Still, all of them are form of retrieving soul. So that's a general concept about what soul retrieval concept is. Then I will kind of come down to a little bit more practical and practice aspect of it. So the second part is the idea of pain body. I wanted to come back the pain body, idea of pain body, more pain identity. So this term pain identity, I have been using it for a long time. And, uh, and so it's not in some way, it is indirectly, but it's not specifically connected with the Tibetan tradition. But in principle, it is very much rooted in the principle of t teaching. So, um, so pain identity, um, I think in some sense, all the teaching, teachings of Sutra, teaching of Tantra, teaching of Dzogchen, all cross teachings, it, all the teachings are about finding oneself. Um, ultimately, it's, it's called self-realization, knowing oneself. So knowing oneself could mean a true sense of knowing oneself, or knowing oneself means your temporary uh, identity roles that you play, uh, what that role is, what the role or boundaries of the, that role is, how you can make maximum benefit of that role, how you can utilize, how you can serve, how you can uh, you know, protect, and that role can play many, many roles, but that role is just a role that you play, but that's not who you are. So that's not who you are. So you, who you are, in one way to say you, who you are is you are no one. But if you realize you are no one, you can be anyone. You don't have a problem for playing role, any role you don't have a playing uh, problem with any, any role you can, all your role you can play. Every time we have a, uh, when we don't know that sense of we are free and I'm no one, and we're stuck with the one role, then we have a difficult with the, every other roles that we play. So if, yeah, so then there is a role conf conflict. So, so idea of um, pain identity is pain and identity, two things, right? In the psychology, the people talk about uh, identity disorder or multiple personality. So if you think about in Buddhist concept of identity disorder, multiple personality, in some way, we are not diagnosed as a multiple personality diagnosed. We are, we are not diagnosed that, but in some way that we all have multiple personalities. And the, so you have, you have a, um, I don't know, morning you, evening you, angry you, peaceful you, loving you, aggressive you. You have many, many, many you. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about um, guy, the tech guy, uh, Brian Johnson, who is uh, wanting to live forever, not die. He's targeting not dying and it's most tested individual uh, on planet and spending $2 million, 30, 40 doctors uh, annually. Uh, so this guy, but he, what he, one of the things he's saying, he's saying he had basically got free from evening Brian Johnson. He's not a particular, I would not call him particularly a Dharma practitioner. I'm not, I'm not saying he's not a spiritual practice, but he's not our way of thinking Dharma practitioner in that sense. But he clearly, he uses his own term saying, I have got rid of, I do not trust my different identity. And I, I have a self-destructive Brian Johnson, evening Brian Johnson, seven o'clock Brian Johnson, I got rid of him. Now I, what I'm doing, I'm not counting on that person, personality, I am counting on a data that every 89 or 79, whatever the, the, the blood test is doing, every data he's getting back, he's, his behavior, his food, exercise, sleep pattern, everything is based on what the feedback of the data. So, and he's saying he's enjoying his life. He's more fit than 18 years old. Uh, he's, he slept seven, seven months perfect sleep score with a whoop, 100%. So, so you can imagine everything he's doing those things, right? 
one of the things, the reason why I'm emphasizing him, he's saying he have got rid of his self-destructive Brian Johnson personality. And that's what, what I'm trying to talk about. If you think about pain identity, it's, it's not a saying joy identity. It's not a saying productive identity. It's not saying loving identity. It's not saying peaceful identity. It's a, you can have self-destructive identity. And if you look at in your life, you clearly have draining identity, worrying identity, self-destructive identity. These identities are, you're identifying that because you're based on your conditions, your pain and your limitations, what you're not capable, what you lack. That's what you're identifying with. So that identity becomes more or less, it becomes you. Your whole life is operated by that. So that is where I think the risk is, where that is where we can say we lose our soul. Self-destructive self, if, if that's your primary identity, you will lose your soul. You will lose your health. You will lose your life. You will lose your job. You will lose your relationship. You will lose everything in a matter of time, slowly or faster. Or soul retrieval, idea of soul retrieval. You gain back those, those qualities. How you gain back those qualities? Number one, to know, not to identify with the self-destructive identity. To separate, this is what I identify with, and this identity has been destroying my whole being, entire being. This identity has been destroying my health. Or if you look at, if, if you're having a really serious health issue, you look which identity has caused that destructive health. If you're having a lot of issues in a relationship, you have to look which identity, your identity, which has caused that particular issues in a relationship. Whatever, uh, uh, issues, specific issues that you are facing in your life is one single identity is responsible for that single situation. And, and there's no way, there is no way to overcome that story, that problem or that issue unless you are fully able to address that one single direct related pers personality. And if you can, I mean, I'm trying to make it in a simple way. You can think about very complicated way, six realms, six lokas, six Buddha family, six energy, six goddesses, six dakini. You can go on and on trying to make it a complicated conversation. I'm trying to keep it simple here. So, so, so it's good to look at what is that personality for each one of us. So if you think about soul retrieval, um, I would say that General concept here, we could say Dzogchen. Dzogchen means great perfection. Great perfection means who we are, we are great perfection. We are complete. We are full. We are uh, unbounded space. We are infinite possibility. We are light. We are pure energy. We are joy. We are peace. We are all the enlightened qualities we are. But we, we can say, I am those things, which you are those things. Or you can, you can use even the language idea, I am sick. You, you, can, you're, that's, you see, it's, when you say, I am sick, and I've been sick, I am sick, and all my friends, most of my friend is I, coming from my sickness. I have a doctor. Is, because I'm sick, the doctor is my, I like that doctor. I have my nurse, I like the nurse because I'm sick. My friend, all my friends and friends, people who love me, comes out of my identity of sickness. So when you build this sick, sickness identity, and all your relationship around social relationship also build around your sickness, and somehow you don't want it to not, get, you don't want it to get better unless you want to lose all your friends. So either sickness, I'm in pain, I'm not well, I am old, I'm not capable, I'm not good, I am sad, 
you can say I am and all those things. These are all identities that you're identifying with consciously or unconsciously. And how much you identify, how long you identify, how openly you identify, how secretly you identify, you should be aware of it. So, but that's not who we are. So our sense of ourselves is Dzogchen, great perfection, I am complete. So I am complete, and all this quality coming out of completeness is part of where I nourish from. So if I think about myself, my body, um, my level of energy, my mind, my emotion, all this nourishment source of healing, all this nourishment where it's coming from is who I am. And all this disruption is coming from who I am not and what I identify with. That is where all the disruption is coming. Who I am, when I have any connection to who I am, all the healings are coming, naturally healings are coming. So many times, it's not, in the, in, if you look at in our life, many times, it's not how much we do. I think it's good to, good to do less and make more happen. Good to talk less and have more communication. And good to think less and be more creative. So it's not more of anything from pain, but it's more allowing things to happen from source. So that is what we have to learn in this process of when I talk about the healing. So let's say, so I will say one more thing and then I will think we'll, we'll, we'll try to kind of have a little experience of this. So, There's a stories about spontaneous remissions, like healings, like people, um, I don't remember, uh, there's this book, book, and she is, she was, she's emphasizing on this quite a bit. I don't remember her last name, but her first name is Lisa. She lives in a Marine somewhere. Um, she wrote a book called Mind Over Medicine, it, a medicine, original doctor but anyway the main point my main point is that that one of the ways many many hundreds of thousands of cases of spontaneous remission healing happens when uh, forced uh, cancer stage four and cardiovascular heart disease and AIDS and many diseases terminal diseases where people got the spontaneous remissions that's just got healing and uh, and one of the mechanism when they're trying to find out with all of thing all of these things is that in this this place of they were able to this health self healing mechanism self recovering mechanism it's on when we are not in the stress mode when we are in the parasympathetic nervous system is activated when we are in that resting mode our self-protecting, self-healing, self-recovering, self-charging, its own. So you naturally, this is a natural part of ourself. When, when we are in this, our pain identity manifests, when we are in the fight mode, when we are in the stress, stress mode, that very moment, the self-healing system shuts down in our body. We start, we begin to drain ourselves. We begin to become anxious in ourselves. And, th and those moments, those hours when it becomes long, that's where we get sick. That's where we begin to lose the sense of peace in ourselves. That's where we begin to feel anxious before going to sleep. That's where we develop insomnia. So idea here is to, to connect back to the source who we are by able to rest with all the anxiety and anxiousness of who we are not through breath, through awareness. When we calm down, what, what I call three precious pill, stillness through the body, silence, uh, silence through the speech, and uh, spaciousness through our mind, when we do these exercises, go back, connect to our source, and remaining there is where we are charging, where we are healing, where we are retrieving our soul. So that is, um, it's, it's somewhere between uh, 
understanding of Dzogchen principle and some sense of even burn shamanic traditions teachings where retrieval, uh, retrieving the soul through elemental essences, what we call. I don't know if it's making any sense here what I'm talking. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we'll do a little practice, okay? So, so feel, sit comfortably. Keeping your spine straight as much as possible. Chest slightly open. Chin slightly down. Bring your full attention to this sacred space. Bring attention to this, this special moment, present moment. Bring your attention in your body. Bring your attention to your breath. So be aware of any effort, discomfort, pain, blockages, numbness in your body. Be aware of that, like even if it's a pain, bring sense of openness to it, connection to it, some warmth, care, and then breathe out deep. So the breathing, like a are about four seconds in, eight seconds out, around there, but breathing into your those areas of the body and breathe out from the nose and feeling those areas of the body, particularly and generally all your body is feeling more resting, more grounded, Deeper stillness is the door to inner stillness. So feeling the stillness in your body by breathing out those tensions, pain, blockages. So continue for, for one minute. Four seconds breathing in from the nose. Eight seconds breathing out from the nose. Or at least twice longer out from the nose every Slow, deep exhalation, clearing directly those blockages, pain, discomfort with the awareness of the body. Breathe out and feel deeper awareness of the stillness in the body and ground in your body in that stillness.
each time you exhale deep, low from nose, you're grounding more in your body and discovering deeper stillness, connectedness in your body. Feel that, continue. Continuously be very clear, very aware of the stillness in your body, grounding in your body, connected to your body. This stillness in your body is the door to that great perfection, to that source. Source, natural healings are coming, natural energies are flowing, nourishments are coming, being connected to there is charging like the phone, when it is connected to the power, you don't have to sit there, you don't have to ask, you don't have to watch, you just leave, make sure it's connected. And connection is what is charging. So you're, you're connected to the stillness, through this stillness, connected to the source. This connection is charging your body, retrieving energy in your body, recovery in your body is happening. Healing in your body is happening. Just feel that. Trust that. Continue for a few more breaths. Okay, next we'll move to next door. Be aware of silence of your speech. Or at least maybe you can also try, just think about social medias, think about the noises out there, think about argument, discussions, all the talk, think about all those things, voices, and feel the exhaustion from those, and turn inward to the silence, and feel silence. and be aware of the silence of the speech. Be aware of the silence of the speech. 
being quiet, being in silence, it's different than being aware of that silence. So I'm asking to be aware of that silence. Feel the silence. Connect with that silence. Be in that silence. Be the silence. And breathe continuously deep. Four, eight breathing. Four second in, eight second out. Nose, nasal, slow and deep. And each time exhalation, clearing any sense perception, feelings of noises, all the noises. And of every deep exhalation, feel the connection to the silence deeper. Even silence is deeper. Silence is not only absence of noise, it's the presence of awareness of the silence. Continue breathe. Continue. Become more aware of the silence. Connect deeper with the silence. Allow the silence to nourish you. Silence to heal you. Silence to discover your voice, power of your voice. You for a minute. Now, the third one, the last one, mind. Essence of our mind, the nature of our mind is empty, it's spacious, it's open.
just, just simply be aware of all the thoughts that you have, all the emotions that you have, all the feelings that you have, all the memories that you have. Just for a moment, let all of them dissolve like a different clouds in the sky. Let them dissolve. A wisdom wind, wisdom awareness is clearing all those clouds away. And you remain in this a luminous, clear sky within. In a sense, a break from identities and free from all these roles and identities. I'm no longer a cloud, I am the sky, I am the sun. A sense of inner sky, inner light. Rest there, connect with that inner spaciousness of the mind. And once again, do four, eight breathings. The purpose of the four, eight breathings is if there's any effort, any discomfort, any little thoughts, little emotions, little feelings obscuring the sky, be aware of that. Breathe out and reconnect with this boundless luminous sky within. Every exhalation, deep, slow, nasal, four second exhalation out. Rest deeper, deeper in that luminous sky within. So continue for one minute. Now, all three together, trying to feel all these three doors together, the stillness of the body, feeling it, grounding in it, breathing through it, silence of your speech, feeling it, being aware of it, grounding in it, the spaciousness of your mind, feeling it, being aware of it, grounding it. So being in the stillness, in silence, in spaciousness, through this connect, connecting to your source, to yourself. These three things are called three doors. Door of the body, stillness. Door of the speech, silence. Door of the mind, spaciousness. And these three doors, doors to yourself, to your souls, yourself. 
when you're resting there, you're no longer draining. When you're connected to the source, you're not only stop draining, but you're recharging. You're charging. Because you're self-aware. Self-healing is there in self-awareness. Self-recovery is there. Self-protection is there. A spontaneous self is there. Effortless self is there. Flexibilities, identities are there. Because deep inside you are no one. And no one, awareness of that no one, the power of that no one, allows you to be anyone. Feel that power of not needing to identify with one. Have confidence, trust, and be able to take refuge the truth of realizing no one. Feel that sense. Okay. So I will maybe say a little bit about the practice what we did, and then I'll let uh, have some time to ask some questions. That okay? Um. So this pain body or pain identity. I think pain identity is a better way to say it. Pain identity is who truly we are. We are this infinite possibility. We are boundless space. If you were to use the word, there's only three words I can use. I'll say we are boundless space, infinite light, infinite possibility. The, the dynamic energy. So we say ma, pu, sal. In Dzogchen says mother, child, and dynamic energy. This is who we are. Boundless space, infinite awareness, and dynamic energy. Dynamic energy means we can be any, any, we can be anyone, any moment. We can do anything. The possibility that's the dynamic. The pain identity is weakness. It's it's a rigidity. Pain is very predictable. Pain is very rigid. When you destructive pain identity is a very predictable, rigid, and it. When it identify with something, it never it have always problem changing their identity into something else. That's why it's not a dynamic. 
That's why it suffers a lot of consequences. That's why even it, it doesn't seize the, all the opportunity sources because it lives in the past or it lives in the future. Identities are like that. If you think about sleep, for example, you know, which I'm, I'm very much into sleep these days. <laughs> so if you think about a sleep, when you have a sleep issues, it's also identity. If you think of any, maybe I'm sure you don't, none of you have a sleep problems, but if you do, if you look at, the, when, you, when you think about sleep, what do you think? Wow, sleep, exciting, enjoying. I miss, I wanted to go, go into the sleep right away. I'm looking forward, go tonight, go to sleep. You feel that or you oh, sleep, you know, I have to go. And the end of the day, you, you know, all your friend leaves and your office is closed, the light shuts down, even the highway becomes empty, you know. I have to go to sleep now. It's not exciting. No, no good relation to the sleep. Or Identity with your bedroom. When you think about bedroom, what do you think? Oh, my bedroom, wow, this beautiful sacred temple where I recover every night, where I heal every night, where I discover different dimension, different, different pure lands, I, I, where I encounter with all the enlightened being, goddess and dakinis, where I discover, where I have communication with all the spirits, where I visit all the mystic libraries. This is amazing dream journeys I can do. Do you feel like that? Oh, that's the place of miserable, struggling place. I am waiting for morning to arise. That's the identity. But when you moment you look at the bedroom, because why? Because one, when you're struggling in the room, bedroom, and you're trying to sleep, trying to sleep, trying to sleep, trying to sleep. And every moment you don't sleep, you're struggling. Every struggling is becomes a part of your identity in relation to the bed, bedroom. So you don't like your bed, you don't like your bedroom. So you should not struggle. You should go out of your bedroom, suffer in your kitchen. And when, you, when you're tired of suffering, come back to your bedroom, right? Then you feel, oh, this is a great place to rest. Kitchen is the place of my suffering, right? Identity. And the worst part is not a bedroom, it's the sleeper, insomnia, identity. I have sleep problem. And you think about it, you talk about it, you share with other people, as if people are interested to know you, don't you have a problem sleeping, nobody's interested in that, right? But you identify with that. So the only way to overcome this problem of sleep is to clear the identity of sleep, clear the identity of the bedroom, clear the identity of insomnia. Then only you will overcome the sleep. When you wake up three in the morning, you're trying to go back to sleep. Then you think, okay, I have... Uh, um, Few hours left. I hope I can sleep. You go ahead. Look at it again. Time. One hour past. I have two hours left. One only one hour left. So you you keep looking like that, you know, so that someone is suffering not to sleep. That identity. So you have no way, you don't know how to let go of that one who is suffering. Because if you forget about that insomnia identity, you fall asleep like a baby. Baby is not looking at, have you seen your baby, every baby looking at the clock saying, you know, I have only a few hours left. They go for 15 hours straight, right? They're not looking at the clock. They're not worried about not sleeping. As long as their stomach is full, they're ready to go to sleep. Right? So, so if you think about a sleep, it's not the sleep only. If you look at entire your life, it's the same thing. So this, what I'm trying to say here really is the idea of soul retrieval, idea of 
this spontaneous healing, um, self-healing, self-recovery, -re self-protection, um, self-awareness, um, spontaneous service, a spontaneous joy, a dynamic action. These things are amazing productive creative energy that most of the time we lack them. We reason why we lack them is because our destructive, limited, single or few identity occupies most of our time of the week. And we think that's who we are. That's not who we are. And if you and if you look, and one way to, one way to find out, at least being a little bit more aware with your senses. You know, if one person is complaining about you, you can say, no, that's one person. Two, three, four, five people complaining about you, I think you better pay attention. And thank them. At least if the five is complaining, not 1,000 is complaining, because it's going to end up soon 1,000 people. Because some, they are just telling you some, some sense of your limitations. So this, this idea of spontaneous healing, um, soul retrieval, retrieving soul, retrieving energy, not losing energy, protecting energy, I think is really, really important key in our modern society because we are draining ourselves for nothing. Every single day, we are draining ourselves for nothing, being so busy doing nothing. Okay, anyway, so I'll leave some questions here. Thank you. Beautiful and sobering to hear this. Um, I'm gonna ask the first question and then I will ask the audience. We didn't talk tonight um, or so far really about retrieving from the natural elements. But one thing I hear a lot from students and from the world and then from the field of psychology, all this concern with climate distress. So people who are experiencing anxiety, they can't sleep, many other things, they're worried about the natural world. And I just wonder how different the practice that you're offering, right, drawing from the essences of the natural world. So just wondered if you had thoughts on, can those practices support us in climate distress? Sure. So so first of all, people who really wanted to worry, they will always find a way to worry. If they stop worrying, then they will worry about why I'm not worrying. So I think <laughs> it's, 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 that's true because ultimately, even uh, let's, I mean, environment, I'm, uh, it's so important for, for us the survival of the environment is so important. Global warming is an issue. But from the bigger, very, very, very big picture point of view, it's our problem. It's not a nature's problem. Okay, one of the things they say about the AI, fear of AI, why one should be fear of AI, is because maybe some point in the future, there are group, small groups of people, or maybe even getting bigger group of people, maybe they really think, that we, we don't need to be here. It's okay if we wipe out all the human beings on the earth. It's better for the nature, better for the world, better for the earth. And if did that concept, of course, probably none of you will agree. I not, not, hope not agree with that. And I don't agree with that. But maybe, maybe, I don't know, I can change my mind. I don't know. But at least now I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> but in some point, that concept becomes a part of the AI. And AI has a capability to bypass the human's decision, can wrap out in one moment, everybody's gone, and the nature can survive well, happily, right? So, so the idea of, I think, in the first place, why we do what we do, why we destroy so much, why we need so much. This is the issue, I think. 
So the issue is, of course, environment issue is the nature. Issue is our less connection to the nature. Uh, you know, issue is not knowing how much the healing powers we can gain by exposed to the nature. I do a lot of sometimes fasting. So like when I do like a 10 day fasting or something, and I feel that I, I experiment that, you know, I'm working with the nature, retrieving my food from the nature. That doesn't mean I'm eating tree or something. I'm just being with the tree. I'm breathing air. I'm being in the sun. And I'm uh, grounding myself on the earth and trying to feel the spirit and liveliness of the nature. And, and with this energy, I can feel my, I don't have a, less issues with the hunger. I feel so much more nourishment. And so for sure, I really believe that the, the, in my book, I talk about not only the nature, but we talk about in burn tradition, we talk about the spirits of the nature. There are spirits who uh, connected to the nature and it's you, it is, you have to work with them too. Like the land, landlords of tree and landlords. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we owe a lot for them, you know? Yeah. Thank you, Rinpoche. And my question is regarding um, connection to the spirits in the natural world. And in your tradition, what is the most effective and uh, appropriate way of connecting with them and really being in tune with the higher intelligence and the wisdom, the guidance that they offer to us? So I think the most important thing is to treat them as like we treat each other humans. We, at least we're trying to treat, to treat each other with respect. We, when we see another human, we see someone is there. When we see a tree, it's, it's, as, as Eve said, it's like transactional. You know, you, you, you go in the nature, who can run faster, who can climb faster, higher. And we always is like a support sport or, or, or just entertainment or fun or something like that. We don't teach treat them as some another being, another spirit, uh, sacredness. Uh, they have a life, they have a home, they have a, like, a, like a family. We don't treat them like that. I think the most important th thing will be to treat them that. You know, anytime when you pass by a tree or, or, or feel that sense of uh, respect or make little Take the flower, make an offering, or like something like that, or at least that honoring um, some element mantras or uh, prayers or something like that. That I think that would be a good way to do it. And and in in our tradition, they, we believe that um, that one of the reason why we have so many new diseases, what they call tunic. Timely diseases, time diseases, uh, diseases coming out of time. Maybe even like COVID, COVID the viruses are like some something that has to do with the time and environmental and pollution, all these chemicals and so on. So they 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 come out because the spirit are provoking us because it's like they're saying you you have done this much damage, now we're going to destroy you in in this way. So it's like a way of or vocation. And, and shaman, in the world of shaman, they think, they clearly think that it is like a provocation of, from the other world. And so we, and the, so some sense of, I think, sense of being humble. And when it comes to the nature, trying to bow down, respect them, offer something. And that feeling of, you know, like refuge or protection or something like that, a source of nourishment, as I was saying earlier, and that it's not it's not just they're there, but you can you receive so much, you know. So I think it's very important, you know. Even even you from if you think about not a shaman point of view, I, I try to combine with the science and shaman, shamanic idea together, right? As Oxen I did. One of the my combination is every morning I do a sun gazing practice. Reason why? Because now in, in terms of the sleep, that you need to get your morning exposure to the sun, sunlight, for to set up your circadian rhythm. And with physical movement, you're doing your salung yoga, your some exercises outside in the sun, getting exposed to the sun, maybe 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever. So 
in Dzogchen tradition, we gaze sun gazing. We call sun gazing meditation. So you, you look at, not directly, you look at the sun and you abide in the nature of mind. That means you're connecting to your own source. You're connecting through this light vision. So from light, you are activating your inner light. You're, you're in, a, in a circular rhythm. You're saying you're setting your inner clock, right? So clearly there is, is this benefit of uh, healing property from the sunlight, setting circadian rhythm, and respecting that light outside, and if seeing the door of entering into the, your own inner light, nature of mind. I do every morning that. So, or, yeah. So, many ways. I think it's a wonderful, we live in a so wonderful time to see how many of these elements can be understood from different way, from scientific way, and their, their effect on us, on a biological effect on us, psychological effect on us, how much light has it having effect on our mood, psychological state, and so on, right? So, for example, uh, like, or I don't know, uh, the, there are, uh, how many, is this any, anybody you use in the morning, like 10,000 lux to get your, uh, morning uh, to overcome your uh, sets your clock or overcome your sense of depression alertness. How many people use it? Okay, so so you know people are using this light, simple light, which has about ten over about ten thousand lux at this mm, meter power, and you turn twenty twenty minute in the morning in your room. You're just sitting there. It's setting up some inner mood and emotions and things like that. So. It, in a Dzogchen tradition, we do salon exercise, we activate these lights inside. So, for example, a rikpa, inner light, when you, when you are aware of, I'm not talking about the scientific point of view, I'm sure there will be someday, there will be, there will be research about it. So, being in that state of rikpa, I'm sure there's some kind of light is activated inside. People who go into the dark room for many days, like 50 days or 100 days, there is no single report of being depressed there. It's the opposite. They are more agitated. They're activated more with their visionary experiences. They're more, some part of the brain are more active in, 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 the, in the night, in the sleep, in the dark room than in the light. So there are all this amazing science and technology and this ancient spiritual practice can come together, support each other. So I, I think it's a fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we've been doing some element um, practice with Eve in the Wednesday night Panga, and we started talking about fire, I think it was two weeks ago. And uh, I've really, you know, we were talking about this gazing at the sun. I've woken up every morning and I'm gazing at fire. I have a propane fire pit doing this practice. But I, I, I'm really interested in how you view or how you can frame fire in the way you were talking about uh, sun. Can you tell us a little bit about your practice of the element of fire? So generally in our tradition, when they, we do a fire rituals, fire puja, um, there are many different ways people do that. In the monastery, we do that. So I personally, uh, we don't do a specific like that. Um, of course, we sometimes we make fire in the winter, and when we make a fire in a home, we will always try to have not just enjoy the fire in a fireplace, but have that special relationship. Like, for, for example, even my wife, she's used to Nepali culture a little bit. You turn on light, you immediately do the salute to the light every single time when you turn on the light. So that kind, it's just not light to be used, but it's a sacred. Thank you for illuminating my room. So that always, uh, or, or uh, every morning we will at our home, every morning we will light one, ca one candle. So even when I'm not there, at least for a teenage, even he does that. So that so that there's a fire there in that sense, incense there. But other than that, uh, not in terms of the big fire, um, yeah, I yeah, 
just don't have the opportunity to do that. Yeah, but in, in the sun, as I said, uh, definitely trying to build that sacred relationship. Uh, yes. And recitation of the mantra, yes, definitely we will do. And then uh, we then we will do in terms of the like five salon exercise, five salon exercise we do. And this the five salon exercise is way of activating each of these five element in our body. So in different locations with the different organs, that exercise I do every day, yeah. And, yeah. and Rinpoche, we can find the Salung exercise online, yeah? You have yes. many teachings of that. So, so there is a, um, if you go, it says five Salung exercise by Tenzin Wanji Rinpoche in YouTube, you have plenty. Uh, if you wanted to go more into deep into this exercise, then there's called Awakening the Sacred Body. So in that, and that book, there's a, a DVD and the whole explanation of these five exercises. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Josh. Um, my question is, uh, our practices sort of um, evolve steadily and then sort of exponentially at times. And it seems as though, you know, you've broken, not broken, but you've moved from traditional settings into a Western space, which is also breaking and um, or dislocation from where you started. I'm wondering, um, can how, when did soul retrieval, when did the inspiration for soul retrieval, um, when did you become aware of it? And in your practice, did you, when have you seen sort of the developments of that thinking um, come through? So first of all, I don't feel anything is broken. I feel everything is evolving, growing, expanding, and, uh, and I'm very happy about it. Uh, yes, so in terms of, uh, you know, you live in the monastery as a monk, I left that. Actually, probably that was never part of me and I was just put it in the monastery. So I found myself there, then I choose to go to the monastery. But I'm very happy, whatever university, whatever the universe brought me, wherever it brought me, however it brought me, every thing what happened in my life, I'm so grateful, I'm so happy. And everything what I have alive, life, I felt like everything meant to happen exactly in that way and that sequence my, for my involvement. But nothing is broken. Well, that just to be clear. Second, as far as a soul retriever is concerned, you should read my book first fully, dealing with the form, energy, and light. Then you will understand a little bit what what, what I'm trying to talk, what I'm talking about it. Uh, as far as general ideas of you know um, my personal view about all these things, I really feel that. That to go to the core of your self-realization, I feel that's that's my practice. And if you are there, you are okay with nature, you're okay with the trees, you're okay with the people, you're okay with the other, you're okay with the differences, you're okay with the opposite, you're okay with the people who attack you. You're okay with every, there's no stressor out there. No, there's no, nothing can drain you because you feel a connection to yourself. And so that, personally, I feel that is the most powerful and uh, most difficult maybe in some way, but it's also very exciting to that journey of self-realization and firing different identity is the fun part. And not, bro maybe you can say breaking. Break them, break them down. Break each identity which is no more useful. And even if it's a cultural thing, break it down. If it's a social thing, break it down. But somehow, it doesn't mean um, that, I think the main thing is, it should not become a destructive, self-destructive or destructive other. Even psychological disorders, like multiple personality. What is the, how you, how you diagnose that multiple personality? is that one personality 
it becomes a threat to another personality, then that's where the diagnosis comes. It's a danger. But if one person's personality is helping the other personality and different personality, they're happy together as a family, they cannot imagine without one another, then these personality are working out very well, very, very, very peace, contributing to each other. So our existence in this the world, we should be contributor to the world, and we were the receivers of the contribution from others' world, and not just, just becoming any means of destructive to, to yourself or others. And that if that journey is evolved through self-realization, I think that seems you don't even need soul healing. The soul will not be damaged. Thank you, Rinpoche. Yeah, I really feel like you've given us so many opportunities to be curious about what's already inside of us and kind of pointing towards the ways we can find refuge. And I love that you use the word source here as well. I'm so deeply appreciative of you being with our community. Thank you. And I just want to really thank everybody here for showing up, for practicing. I can really feel the sense of presence in the room. I'm so grateful for that. And if you haven't joined us before on a Wednesday night, please join us. We have at least another month working our way through Rinpoche's book, and we'll be able to talk more and practice more. But being here with you tonight, wow, such an inspiration. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here to share, share just like this, mumbling here and there, everything. I hope it makes some sense, any beneficial, <laughs> and at least I do my best, yeah. And would you mind dedicating the merit for sure. us? Sure. So what dedication usually you do? So yeah, you, sure. Yes, you'd be Okay, yeah. very humbly I will <laughs> offer. So if it feels comfortable putting hands together in front of the chest, in any posture that feels like an offering, Taking a moment and reconnecting to the breath. Finding those three doorways of precious pills. And considering if there's any benefit being here together, maybe an inspiration or idea, maybe a felt sense in the body. If there's any of that that has been generated here tonight, we symbolically and with our full hearts offer it. And the offering is an aspiration, outrageous aspiration that all beings, <clears throat> that all beings could be happy, know the causes of happiness. All beings could experience peace and ease and belonging that each and every being, entire planet, could be free. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rinpoche, and thank you, Mitch, for driving Rinpoche and inviting him. Really appreciate that. We hope, of course, you will join us again sometime.